Good afternoon. Welcome to this special Cambridge Forum presented with Penn New England's Freedom to Write Committee. Today we're working in partnership as the Penn New England presents its 2009 Vasil Stuss Freedom to Write Award and hosts a panel discussion about the power and the pitfalls of writing political satire in the age of John Stewart and Al Franken. The program is entitled Fairly Unbalanced. Our panel today is going to be moderated by Elizabeth Searle. She's the co-vice chair of Penn New England, and she is also the author of three books of fiction, including Celebrities in Disgrace, a satiric novella, which is forthcoming as a short film from Bravo Sierra Motion Pictures. Her most recent work is a musical comedy, Tonya and Nancy, The Rock Opera. She is currently working on a novel inspired by Bristol Palin. Elizabeth teaches at Stone Coast MFA. So now here is our moderator to introduce the program and our panelists. But first, an important reason why we're gathered here is to award Penn New England's 2009 Vassal Stuss Freedom to Write Award, recognizing a writer who has suffered for the peaceful expression of his or her views. And this year, that writer does happen to be a satirist. Good afternoon. The Vassal Stuss Freedom to Write Award is given annually by Penn New England to a writer who is currently being censored, silenced, or imprisoned. It honors Vassal Stuss, the Ukrainian poet who was the last writer to perish in the Soviet gulag. For obvious reasons, the award is most often given in absentia, and this year is no exception. We've been unable to find a suitable proxy to accept the award on behalf of this year's winner, and we're still trying to find the proper channels through which to bestow the monetary portion of the award to this year's recipient without further endangering him or his family. The 2009 Vassal Stuss Freedom to Write Award is presented to Noura Muhammad Yassin. In some countries, writing can be mo the most dangerous business there is. Noura Muhammad Yassin is a 35-year-old writer, a husband, and a father. He writes poetry and essays and short stories. At least he used to once upon a time. Noura Muhammad Yassin is in prison. He was sent to prison in 2004, and he won't be released until 2014. He's there because he wrote a short story. To be precise, he's in, in prison because he wrote a good short story. The Wild Pigeon was good enough to be published. It was good enough to win an award, good enough to be noticed and read and discussed. But Yassin's story was political allegory, a fable about a captured bird that would rather take its own life than remain in a cage. And Yassin is a Uyghur. You may have heard of the Uyghurs, a mostly Muslim people who inhabit the oil and mineral rich area of China, formerly known as Turkestan. A people perhaps best known for their unhappiness at finding themselves a part of China. To Western countries, China paints the Uyghurs as terrorists allied with radical Islam. At home, China has been quietly dismantling their culture. Ethnic Han Chinese are being encouraged to move into Uyghur-dominated areas, while Uyghur homes are being demolished, families broken up, and dispersed to other parts of China. In The Wild Pigeon, a mother warns her son that humans are encroaching on the bird's traditional territory. They want to chase us from the land we've occupied for thousands of years, to steal our land from us. They want to change the character of our heritage, to rob us of our intelligence and our kinship with one another, strip us of our memory and identity. In China, allegory and satire are not acceptable forms of writing for a Uyghur. So on November 29, 2004, the writer's dream became a living nightmare. Yassin was arrested and charged with inciting Uyghur separatism. He was convicted in a trial held behind closed doors. He had no lawyer. Yassin was sentenced to 10 years in prison, which in China means a work camp. In theory, he'll be released in 2014, but he's not been allowed visitors 
No one has seen him since he was transferred to Urumqi prison number one. We don't even know if he's still alive. Writing is a dangerous business. Every American should know about Nur, Nur Muhammad Yassin. Here, where millions of people can watch the Daily Show and bookmark The Onion, it's especially important to remember that in some countries, the simple act of writing a short story can get you sent to prison. It's important, too, to remind the Chinese that the world has not forgotten this man, that the world is watching and waiting for his release. Radio Free Asia's translation of The Wild Pigeon contains many moving passages. But for me, the Godot-like exchange between the pigeon's captors as they watch the bird refuse to eat or drink is one of the most haunting. Just let him go. To watch a pigeon such as this die slowly is too pitiful. Setting him free does us no good. Nothing good will come of this. Nothing good will come of this in any event. Thank you for remembering Nur Hamid Yassin. Today we honor this brave young man whose only crime was to write a short story with the presentation in absentia of the Vasselstus Freedom to Write Award. Let's hear it for Nur Muhammad Yassin. May someone uh, surfing the web hear how much we care. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. All right, welcome to the Cambridge Forum discussing Fairly Unbalanced, Writing Political Satire in the 21st Century. I'm Elizabeth Searle, co-vice chair of Penn New England. And let me first introduce our panelists, and then we will have our dynamic demonstration of satire at work by Jimmy Tingle. And then we'll move right into our consideration of the power and pitfalls of writing political satire in this age of John Stewart's entertainment news that many turn to as their major source of information, of Al Franken, the comedian and satirist who's become a serious political candidate and who spoke right here several years ago. I was lucky enough to be in the audience. And I remember he received a standing ovation before walking onto stage just by being introduced with the title of his book, Lies and the Lying Liars Who Tell Them. <laughs> and I remember well the feeling that some had at that time, especially that the closest thing they could get to the truth came from satirists and comedians. So here to discuss the art of writing satire in this time when a 24-hour news cycle can transform fair and balanced into fairly unbalanced are our fairly unbalanced panelists. First, Percival Everett, all the way from California, is a distinguished professor of English at the University of Southern California and author of 16 books, including, and we have it over here, the 2009 publication of I Am Not Sidney Poitier. <laughs> three collections of short fiction and two volumes of poetry. His many awards include the Penn Center USA Award for Fiction and the Academy Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And thank you, Percival, for coming so far. Baron Wormser, beside Percival, is he wrote poetry and worked as a librarian for 25 years living with his family in an off-the-grid house on 48 acres in Mercer, Maine. His memoir, The Road Washes Out in the Spring, a poet's memoir of living off the grid, concerns that experience. The author of eight books of poetry and three prose works, he was poet laureate of Maine, so he has walked the corridors of power. <laughs> Since 2002, he has taught at the University of Southern Maine's MFA program, Stone Coast MFA. So thanks, Baron. And beside him, we have Lisa Haynes. Lisa is the author of three books, including her most recent, Small Acts of Sex and Electricity. She is the writer in residence Emerson College and has served as the prestigious Briggs Copeland Lecturer at Harvard. She has been a finalist in the Penn Nelson Algren Awards and the Patterson Fiction Prize. Her new satiric novel, Girl in the Arena, is forthcoming this fall from Bloomsbury. Thanks, Lisa. Okay. And 
representing the Harvard Lampoon, we have Teddy Sherrill. Uh, the Harvard Lampoon is America's oldest continuously published humor magazine. It's long been famous for its satire of many types, including fake issues of major magazines. Its editors have included George Plimpton, Fred Gwynn, John Updike. Its writers are widely successful in American TV comedy from Al Franken on Saturday Night Live to Conan O'Brien and B.J. Novak. 36 Lampoon writers have worked for The Simpsons. <laughs> Teddy Sherrill represents the Harvard Lampoon on our panel. And finally, to get us in gear for our discussion and to give us this demonstration of political satire, we have Jimmy Tingle down at the end there. Jimmy Tingle, proudly born and raised here in Cambridge, broke into Boston's legendary stand-up scene in the 1980s and quickly moved to paid gigs. His many TV credits include two seasons on CBS's 60 Minutes 2, and he co-starred in PBS Travels. He is the only Boston performer who has won a Best of Boston award, both as a performer, stand-up comedian, and producer, his off-Broadway theater. Jimmy Tingle's Uncommon Sense, The Education of an American Comic, became the longest-running one-person show at the Hasty Pudding Theater. His most recent CD is Humor for Humanity, Jimmy Tingle for President, the funniest campaign in history, available at his website, jimmytingle.com. Welcome to Cambridge Forum with an excerpt from his show, Jimmy Tingle. Thanks, everybody, for coming out this afternoon for such a great cause. I'd just like to start off on a positive note. Satire sometimes is very positive and uplifting. Some good news, ladies and gentlemen. They say that Americans are living longer and healthier lives than ever before. They say that 60, 60 years old, is the new 40. I love that. 80 is the new 60. 100 is the new 80. And the afterlife is the new assisted living. <laughs> I love that. Now to the satire. What were the mortgage companies thinking? Do you have a job? No, I don't. Do you have any money in the bank? I really don't. Do you have any kind of collateral? Not at all. You're going to need a house. <laughs> I was reading recently that Delta Airlines, Delta Airlines lost $6 billion last year. Northwest Airlines lost $5 billion last year. Now. They want to merge. <laughs> what kind of a business plan is that? We lost $6 billion last year. You're kidding me. We lost $5 billion. We should get together. <laughs> but I was thinking, if rival corporations can merge for their own mutual benefit, why can't the pro-life forces and the pro-choice forces merge for their own mu mutual benefit? I am suggesting that Planned Parenthood merge with the Catholic Church to create the largest reproductive rights slash adoption center in the world. <laughs> Plan Catholics of the hood. <laughs> and focus on what we have in common. <laughs> Wall Street lost billions of dollars last year, yet many of the executives still felt they were entitled to the end of the year bonuses because they compared their bonuses, their multi-million dollar bonuses, to tips for a waitress. <laughs> really? Let me ask you a question. If you order a steak dinner from a waitress and she loses it, <laughs> are you supposed to tip her? <laughs> Why can't the federal government fully fund national public radio and public television? Why? Why do they have to constantly do fundraisers? Why? You don't see other publicly financed institutions in this country doing fundraisers. You never see the space program do a fundraiser. You never see some retired astronaut come on television and say, listen, we just put a man on the moon. We need a million dollars to bring him back. <laughs> He's running out of air. <laughs> Let's go to the video clip. Help! <laughs> I can't breathe. He's turning blue. Are you going to send money? Are you going to let him turn blue? <laughs> now, some people have been recently saying out on television that waterboarding is not a form of torture that waterboarding is simply an enhanced interrogation technique, right? I'd like to say the guillotine is not an instrument of death. The guillotine is merely a sustained cranium detachment device. <laughs> 
You know what I would love? I wish Obama could put Amnesty International in his cabinet, okay, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're experts in terms of human rights. And number two, by having him in the cabinet, it would relieve them of the burden of fundraising. These people's work is so important, and they, they use so much energy asking people for money that they burn themselves out, and they burn out the people who support them. I love Amnesty International. I send them money all the time. Every 90 days, I get another letter in the mail asking me for more money. You can stop torture. You can stop torture. You can stop torture. So can you. <laughs> Quit sending me things in the mail. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And um, the Senate recently voted to build a 700-mile fence, okay, across the Mexican border. Now, a couple of problems with the 700-mile fence across the Mexican border. Okay? First problem, the border with Mexico is 1,900 miles long. <laughs> Okay, now I'm not an expert on immigration, but I would surmise that people fleeing abject poverty will go around the fence. <laughs> and when you think about the risk these people take, take to come to this country, are they not modern day pilgrims? Think about that, sneaking into a country to work. That's incredible. That's like somebody breaking into your house to clean it. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to me, folks. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Wow, thank you, Jimmy. Great way to start. And we also thought we would start by giving each of the panelists a moment to uh, say a few words, have a little brief reading or rant, whichever they prefer. And so we'll just pass the mic down in effect to Percival Everett first and let him say a few words to the audience before we start a discussion. Percival. I was afraid I was going to be first. Um, <laughs> first, I don't know why I was invited here. Um, I'm not really a satirist, um, and my first, my initial impulse was to somehow make fun of panels, um, <laughs> and, and so I will. Uh, it, 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 it seems uh, it, those, those, those who, who, who are on the other side of the political uh, fence from me have this way of making up slogans. They can capsulize their entire political beliefs in, in one line, you know, things like, you can have my gun when you pry it from my dead cold fingers or something like that. And it seems that all of my friends instead will, um, instead of spending our time writing slogans, we write eight page position papers. And, um, <laughs> and then we get together and discuss it. And, and by the end of our three hour discussion, we realize just how complex the problem is, uh, but nothing for a poster. Um, though actually an eight page poster might be a, a, a good move. Um, I, I don't write about politics as much as I write about the American experience. And, um, and it, even as, as I sit here, um, uh, it's, it's, I've, I've always made myself a promise that I would never go into a church. Um, but here I am. I was tricked. Um, <laughs> but I'll leave it at that and, and move on. And Baron? Well, uh, I'm going to read a um, poem which is from uh, a series of poems I wrote about a United States president um, who is a character whom I created, and the, the president's name is Carthage. So he's named after that empire that was raised by the Romans. And so this is a little poem about this president. It's called Carthage and Airplanes. Carthage likes to ride in airplanes, up in the sky, he can forget about the schedules of Earth. It is almost like thinking, gazing out the window at the clouds. He likes to ponder, we're pretty high up, he says to his aides. I wonder if we could go much higher. Everyone looks thoughtful. Back on Earth, Ten-year-olds heft Uzis. People drop dead on sidewalks. Friendship sours like old milk. How much better it is in the sky. Too bad you have to be going somewhere. Too bad the endless limo will appear and some suit or turban or dashiki will greet you and start telling you about what's going to happen soon or happened yesterday. Why don't you fly around more, Carthage would like to say to them. 
If you live in the sky, nothing happens. You don't even see the rain. It is almost like thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Baron and Lisa. I'm going to read um, a short excerpt, two pages from this novel that comes out in October called Girl in the Arena, and I have to set it up just for a moment. Uh, for a brief intro, if we can imagine our country as we know it in 2009 with this edition, Neo Gladiator Sport. It is a high profile televised blood sport that rivals the NFL. My 18-year-old uh, narrator, Lynn, has grown up in this culture as a neo-gladiator daughter. Her mother, Allison, has married one gladiator after another, and each one has died in the arena. Lynn's current stepfather is her seventh father. She has begun to recognize that she might just be a pacifist, and she isn't sure what to do about that. Chapter One, Girl in the Arena. The clerk asks for my autograph. Do it right across my face, he says. Usually when we're out in public, everyone wants Allison's autograph. My mother's as famous as the men she's married. Over the years, she has signed stomachs, tip sheets, shoes, baby carriages, even a sandwich once, and of course, thousands of arena souvenir booklets. But until recently, few have asked for my signature. Before I can stop her, Allison tells the clerk that I'm the daughter of seven gladiators. Allison is on her usual kick. She wants to open me up more. Seven, the guy laughs. I bet I've seen you on VH1, right? Uh, not really, I say. No, no, it's ESPN. I know who you are. We're talking real glads, right? Sword, shields, heads flying, arms lopped off. Not that TV show with a bunch of batons and cargo nuts, right? Mortal combat, Allison confirms with a polite smile, though not always to the death. That's what I mean, he says, mortal combat. We're at the store in Cambridge that has an underground operation selling war tickets. They aren't actual tickets, they're just called that. You place bets on which countries we'll end up going to war with. In other words, which countries we will bomb senseless. The store handles bets on all sorts of standard gambling as well, scratch-offs, quick picks. Allison says our chance of winning on war tickets is a whole lot better than the state lottery, and now that I've turned 18, I can buy my own. The glass countertop she leans against is part of a cabinet holding an entire display, a miniature Baghdad scene with U.S. and Iraqi troops, soldiers taking cover, heading out on raids, tiny men and women that look like they've already been blown up. My guess is he got that effect by melting them with a lighter. The clerk hands me a marker now. He holds his hair off his forehead so I have plenty of room to scrawl over his greasy brow. I admit it's really the only space. He's heavily tattooed everywhere else. I shoot Allison a panicked look, but she continues with her ticket pick picks. I lift the pen. Don't worry if you hit the nose. It's been broken so many times, I can't feel a thing. This is permanent marker, I say. Nothing's permanent, he says. So I sign Lin G quickly, and then I buy mine. Five Irans, three Afghanistans, two North Koreas. It's easy to feel horrible about this kind of purchase, being a pacifist and all, but if it's going to happen anyway, I just want to make enough money so Allison doesn't have to worry as much about my brother Thad. Getting some great samples of the work here, and now Teddy Sherrill. Thanks, Elizabeth. As you said, I'm Teddy Sherrill, probably the youngest person on this panel and definitely the least qualified. Um, but, but as you said, I am representing the Harvard Lampoon, uh, which founded in 1876, is the oldest comedy magazine in the world. I'm very honored to be here uh, to discuss these interesting and important issues. I'll quickly tell you all uh, a little bit about the Lampoon. The Lampoon, as I'm sure you know, likes to boast about our many illustrious alumni from John Updike uh, to Conan O'Brien. But what we don't really brag about, and I'm, I'm going to correct something you said earlier, um, 
is we don't, we don't really brag about our illustrious failed applicants, uh, which Al Franken is actually one of. Uh, he, is not, he was not elected. Uh, Al Franken, the famous satirist who, who graduated from Harvard in 73, um, applied, applied to be on the Lampoon, uh, was rejected. What, what many people don't know is that he actually came very close. Um, the case went to the Minnesota Supreme Court, uh, <laughs> where uh, Norm Coleman uh, was actually elected to be an editor of the publication. Um, the Lampoon uh, was actually once a, a bastion for satire, especially Harvard-related satire. Uh, but in recent decades, we've tended to steer away from politics. Uh, in fact, I, I looked this up. The last presidential candidate we endorsed uh, was Calvin Coolidge. Of course, uh, we endorsed him in 1960, long after he had passed away. <laughs> um, but in, in very recent years, we've started to get back into it by reviving our old tradition of parodying real magazines. And while we're proud to say that these recent parodies have gotten a bit of notice in the news, our business staff tells us that our readership remains between five and ten people, all of whom are our parents. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Teddy. And Jimmy, you just gave such a fantastic yeah. example of your work, but did you want to throw in a few words before we dive into the questions? No, or that's you want fine. to just jump right in? Sure. Okay, Thanks. well, we put together a bunch of questions, the Freedom to Write Committee, um, and at a certain point in the show, Pat is going to come up and we're going to open it up to the audience, too. So be thinking of your own questions. But I think I'll start with just um, some current events here to get us going. Uh, very recently, I think this past week maybe, Karl Rove called satiric writer Maureen Dowd a bitter, twisted, deranged columnist. Now, you're playing with fire here whenever you do any sort of satire or touch satiric material, and I'm wondering if any of you have had bitter, twisted, deranged responses to your own satiric works. Has anyone generated some actual hate or anger? I've only had those reactions to <laughs> <laughs> Have you? No, um, it's an incredible compliment that he paid her. <laughs> right, no, right. No. Yeah, yeah. Well, it made me wonder if the uh, if Rove thinks the Pulitzer Prize Committee is um, a subversive organization, or simply bitter, twisted, and deranged right. yeah, yeah. in honoring her with a Pulitzer. Um, yeah, and during the time you were at the Lampoon, did you ever get in hot water with the we, things you did? One, we actually did one time, uh, we published a parody last year of National Geographic um, where we included an article <laughs> that the Washington Post interpreted to be very offensive about uh, AIDS in Africa. They completely misinterpreted the article. It was about National Geographic and how they cover uh, third world cultures, but uh, they, they wrote uh, some pretty inflammatory things. We were just honored that someone had noticed our parody. Like, we didn't think anyone read it or knew about it, so. <laughs> Um, I guess to echo what was said, uh, it's a huge compliment to have somebody disagree that sort of intensely with something you've said. Right. Yeah, and Jimmy, you must have, over the years, have you run into any real angry responses? Yeah, usually as a comic, the response is silence. <laughs> 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 you know, when you're on stage and it really doesn't work, there's, you know, you just hear crickets going in the back of the room. <laughs> but um, there's always... If, if you do any political humor, like Carl Rove's statement, for example, there's a lot of people that are pretty vicious in the media all day long, talking mm -hmm. in various mediums. But he doesn't go after those, those people. He goes after the person that he's, whose point of view he disagrees with. And that's usually how it works in terms of angry reactions, whether it's a writer in a, you know, in a, in a country like China that is threatening to the, to the status quo or maybe just a comic on stage or somebody like Maureen Dowd who's whatever she's writing that upset him. I'm sure it was just something he didn't agree with this was with his political point of view. I've been at events where people have asked for their money back. Sure. I've got <laughs> yeah. And I thought the tide was turning in about oh, uh, right around 2004 and I, I did an event it was a, a corporate event and um, they didn't think it was funny. <laughs> they, they wanted their money back. It was the strangest thing. So I gave them their money back. There you go. I don't want your money. If you don't think this is good, if you don't think I did the job for your, you know, for your organization, that's fine. You can have the you can have the money back. They were embarrassed about it, but it was political satire. It had to do with Guantanamo Bay. Right. It had to do with the story at the time that the Koran was flushed down the toilet in Guantanamo Bay, mm -hmm. and then they and Newsweek had to do a re, you know a, a correction. Said it wasn't the Koran. They had made a mistake. Mm -hmm. It was the Geneva Convention that was. <laughs> <laughs> It was actually flushed down the toilet. But stuff like that, they didn't think was funny, so. <laughs> well, now.
now, what, you know, you've just mentioned a whole bunch of hot button, you know, topics that you grabbed hold of. Um, you know, how do you guys come about, you know, what you take hold of in satire, what you'll take on? Have you come upon topics that are too hot to handle, ever attempted to satirize a subject, then pulled back, finding the material in some sense that you couldn't get a grip on it? Or like, what would, what drove you to throw in jokes about Guantanamo Bay or, you know? you to take on some of the subjects you've taken on in your books, even though you might not think of them as satire, but they're certainly hot button subjects. Oh, um, I, I don't know. Was, subjects occur to me, but I, I don't think I've ever been frightened off of anything by how I think people will respond. I have a mm -hmm. novel that's called, um, the title is, uh, I Propose History of the African American People is by Strom Thurmond, as told, to, <laughs> as told to Percival Everett and James Kincaid, and I wrote this with a with my friend J Jim Kincaid, but the novel came to me. It, I sat up one morning and I and I thought that I would write a history of of of, of black people in America, but write it from Strom Thurmond's point of view. Um, what became apparent right away was that I couldn't do it unless I found something to like about Thurmond. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I ended up liking about him was I, I realized that he didn't dislike black people. He just liked white people a lot more. Um, and that, um, and that, in some ways, he was exceptional. Um, but you can read that how you how you like. But you backed off more because of not connecting to the strong. I, I I didn't back off so much as I came to understand more. Right. Yeah, yeah and Theron, these the poems, the whole book, Carthage, seemingly to resemble possibly George W. Bush. What drove you in that direction? Well, you know, uh, just instinctively. Um, I, said, I really want to write about a hapless human being. <laughs> and, um, you know, I started writing that first poem, and I realized, oh, I think I know who this person is. <laughs> you know, and so then it was just kind of downhill. So you did connect. You found a connection. Yeah, so that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Which, that poem was written before the whole hurricane flyover, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And I know Lisa here, her first two books, she would say herself, I think, are not satiric or taking on political no, I'd material. I they're more psychological novels. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was talking to a woman the other day, a psychiatrist, and she said, well, what kind of novels do you write? And I said, well, I think they're pretty psychological. And she said, what novel isn't? Mm -hmm. So that didn't give me any ground to stand on. <laughs> I don't know. And yeah, so what drove you into the satiric arena with this girl in the arena? I'm not sure exactly. I, I keep trying to figure out the exact route, but uh, one thing that came about was that I was in a video store when they still had video stores mm -hmm. with my daughter, and she handed me a video and said, look at the warning on this, Mom. And it was intense, prolonged sequences of disaster and peril. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that sounds like our world. <laughs> um, and that was your title at one point, right? Or yes, it was, title. it yeah. was. And then I saw my daughter one day uh, doing gaming on the internet. Um, I, I can't remember if it was Teen Second Life or World of Warcraft, where you create an avatar, someone who represents you, even mm -hmm. if they don't look at all like you, who can get on a hoverboard and fly through the air and kill demons and so on. And she had a spear through her chest. And I thought, am I supposed to call somebody about this? <laughs> I wasn't sure. And so these different forces started to converge, and, I, and suddenly I was writing about this young girl in this gladiator culture. And for six months I kept thinking, why the hell am I writing this? I have no idea. I have horror violence. What is going on? And then I started to realize that in what, what transpired over the last eight years, Everybody had to make some kind of shift in their lives and in their thinking. Mm -hmm. Because um, whatever happened with Bush and Cheney, that golden, that Midas touch they had, we're going to be paying for that gold for decades to come. So we all have to make that kind of shift. Now, Teddy, what years were you with the Lampoon, and what did they take on? And I know they're not always political, right? They, they take on satire of all sorts of things. Yeah, the Lampoon, um, I, I was there uh, from 2006 to 2008. Mm -hmm. um, the Lampoon um, actually relatively rarely uh, delves into the political. I, I, I think part of that, especially um, 
especially recently, I mean, certainly a big part of it is that we're just not that informed. Um, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but another part of it, likely, is, um, you know, I, I think perhaps until um, the Obama campaign, you know, maybe with some exception for, for the Dean campaign in 2004, mm -hmm. um, I think that there was a sense of sort of checking out and sort of focusing on, um, you know, uh, other things where, where the Lampoon felt it could have more, uh, more of an effect. And, you know, mm -hmm. there may have been some uh, sense in which politics just wasn't that interesting. It seemed like something where, um, you know, there was this terrible situation we couldn't affect. Mm -hmm. Right. And you think that's shifted? Uh, to an extent. I mean, I, the Lampoon still is not, uh, you know, still focuses way more on non-political humor. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that overall, I mean, more, uh, there's certainly more involvement, um, I think, as a trend towards political stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And Jimmy, what drove you into this business when you first? Well, you know, you're trying to make sense of the world. Right. And, uh, as a comic, it's a it's an unbelievably liberating uh, medium to be able to get up on stage and just say whatever you want to say. It's incredible, and I think when it comes to political satire or social satire, it depends on the individual. If they're interested in social and political topics or themes, it's going to be reflected in their act, mm -hmm. usually. And I was just always interested in that type of material. I grew up right here in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. uh, as we all know, it's a very academic city. I don't want to brag, mm -hmm. but from, I'm, from a very, <laughs> I'm from a long line of intellectuals myself. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying I'm better than anybody here. I'm just saying that. <laughs> Growing up, we lived right near a college. Now, as a matter of fact, my father drove a cab here in Harvard Square. He would pick up Harvard professors. They would tell him things. He would come home and tell us. <laughs> so all that information that I gathered, all those, and we went in the, everywhere in the cab. Our whole family went everywhere in my dad's cab. I mean everywhere. One time my father, I kid you not, he took us hunting in the cab. <laughs> And I thought we were going to the White Mountains. He brought us to Woburn. <laughs> but anyway, it's just something that, you know, and I loved it. I loved it, and it was passionate. Like the writers have talked about, sometimes you're mm -hmm. writing, and you don't even know why you're writing. You don't even know what your goals are. Mm -hmm. You're just writing what's coming out. George Collin had a great quote. I read an, article, uh, an interview with him in, in Playboy magazine many years ago in the early 80s. He said, I don't know why I did it. It was all this stuff just screaming to come out. Mm -hmm. And... And that's, you know, that's really what it was for me. There was no goal to be on The mm -hmm. Tonight Show, no goal. I mean, I used to do street performing in Harvard Square, and I admit there was a fine line between street performing and simply being drunk in public. I admit that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so it was just a really a personal journey, I guess, a personal passion. Yeah, well, I love what you say about screaming to get out. And, and one thing we were wondering, um, actually, Richard Hoffman came up with this question, which kind of trying to get at the deeper motivations. He said it's... If, if it's true that satire masks defiance with metaphor, then toward what do you feel defiant? And where have you found these metaphors to mask or couch that defiance? Or, you know, in some cases you're saying it right out straight as a comedian, but anyone want to jump in on that? Do you, do you feel there's a sense of defiance in you, like when you decided to write about George Bush? Or were you coming at it from a different place, Baron? Because I think of his George W. Bush poems as taking a zen approach to the subject almost. Well, it's, you know, it's Zen anger, Elizabeth, so, um, I mean, yeah, I absolutely um, agree um, with the, um, with the defiance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think at times um, the powerlessness that you feel is unbearable, mm -hmm. and uh, you wonder how you're go, really going to go on um, to another day, and as a writer, um, you know, I have to go to that place. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, can't really quite go on living with myself um, if I don't go to that place. And also, it just came back to me actually um, looking at Teddy because it's so long ago. But mm -hmm. um, I was almost thrown out of college in 1968 for satire. Uh, we did a <laughs> piece at, on the college newspaper of uh, Man of the Year, Mass Murderer of the Year. And we did the guy in the tower in Texas, the guy who killed the nurses right. in Chicago, and Lyndon Baines Johnson. And the president of the university looked at that and said, those guys are out of here. 
Uh, so yeah, it does come back to me now, yeah, defiance, yeah. Yeah, That's right. yeah. yeah and you and your fiction, do you tap into that or? Well, it's, you know, it's defiant about a lot of things, I suppose. Um, generally daily stuff about what I have to do around the house. Um, <laughs> but the, um, but it's, I find, I used to be angry a lot of the time, but now I find I'm, I'm mostly amused and, a, and a, sad, a sad amusement, but I, you know, it's the sort of thing where I, I wake up and I read the paper and I think, wow, I never could have dreamed that up. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's, and there's a bit of, of of morbid fun mm -hmm. in it, um, and I, you know, I'm admitting to that. Though it's the first time I've actually admitted it to myself. But there is a bit of morbid fun. I, I just, and you had a, there was a question on the sheet that you distributed to us, our cheat sheet, um, <laughs> which, which, um, which um, asked if, if, um, and I forgot the question now. Um, memory is a thing that I'm defiant about too. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's, well, I can't remember what it is, so I, 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 I'll let someone else well, I'll, I'll scan through and see if anything matches up. I love that phrase, morbid. You said morbid fun? I a can't bit remember of morbid now, fun. No. Yeah, yeah. Now, Lisa, you were talking about as a mother and you know, a person you were feeling a kind of anger. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that in the back of my mind, and I think if you write a novel or a work of fiction toward an end, you've got a very wooden, rotten piece of work mm -hmm. when you're done. But I think somewhere in the back of my mind, I was meditating on the level of violence, cultural violence mm -hmm. that, in particular, that young women are experiencing, because I think there's so little that's really written about that. Mm -hmm. um, we see a lot more young women going off to war. They go off to war, they get raped by their own troops. Um, we have dating violence, we have girls cutting themselves, that they're turning the violence in on themselves. Um, and all of these things get worse as the economy gets worse. Um, if we look at the last census, there's something like 12% of American families are father, mother, child, or children. And we have a, a great number of single parent and particularly single uh, women homes, and those women are making less on the dollar, they're paying more for services. I mean, you can go on. You know, you know the litany. I don't need to go through the list. But in, uh, violence is impacting young women in a way that they don't even have any cu cultural reference for. Mm -hmm. You know, they did not grow up sh pretending to shoot guns and so on. It's just suddenly all coming at them. Mm -hmm. And how do we cope? How do we survive? Yeah, and, and that, I, I'm curious with them. Um, what Teddy said, you know, about a lot of your fellow students were very apolitical for a long time and feeling a sense of nothing I do will make a difference. And were you that way? Do you feel that's shifting? Do you, do you, you don't seem like an angry type person, but do, does, was anger a part of what got you into the political satiring, satirizing business? Yeah, anger, I mean, I think something that really uh, resonated, all the accusations of various types of electoral fraud, um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just the mm -hmm. sense that the political system was in some sense rigged, or, or you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that there was a lot, a lot of the sense of e efficacy was sort of removed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sure, you know, I, I don't want to make a, a blanket statement about, you know, my generation or anything, but I think there, there was a degree of, uh, you know, a, a degree of the sense that it was all, you know, sort of some sort of game that we couldn't, um, mm -hmm. you know, that was being controlled, uh, you know, by people who weren't us. <laughs> right. um, yeah, the Lampoon in particular is an interesting case. Um, the Lampoon is not political in the sense that it is interested in any particular political end. Right. Um, but it is defiant in the sense that it likes to mess with people. Um, so, you know, the Lampoon, I think, um, is sort of an example of this sort of undirected sense that, um, you, you know, that some young people feel where there's not necessarily some arena, um, some political arena where um, one is trying to make a difference, but rather mm -hmm. just a general sense that, um, you know, you'd like to disrupt the, mm -hmm. the sort of system that's, uh, that's going mm -hmm. on. Right. Can I ask a yeah, sure. So that makes me wonder with the photographs we're getting back from Iran. Mm -hmm. 
Have you you've seen some of those? Um, and the protests in the streets. How do you think the youth in general are going to respond to that? And you're not responsible for the whole youth, okay? <laughs> I, but, I, I'm relieved to hear that. <laughs> but you did say there was kind of a change going on. And yeah, well, well, I was personally very, um, I was really inspired by some of the photographs I saw on um, mm -hmm. the streets of Tehran. And, uh, you know, it, it's really interesting um, to see political protesters that sort of look uh, the same age as, yeah. as me. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, that, that in particular and, and following coverage of that in particular um, did seem like something that um, was worth uh, you know, what was, so, you know, no matter whether um, the results of this election changed, it, it did seem like the beginning of, of something. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I wanted to be sure to ask Jimmy this, because I think one of the remarkable things about your career as a comedian and some of the quotes we had about you, rave reviews and so on, that you do manage to have, in a sense, an upbeat, you know, act. It doesn't come across as, you know, so much angry, dark, humor but do you feel I mean is I, that something that fuels you underneath it or I think what what it is is you're in front of people mm -hmm. and it's live and there's a direct connection and they've mm -hmm. paid money and they're they're not going to a lecture they're going to a an entertainment event by mm -hmm. and large so my job really is to is to make them laugh and so it's it's hard it's hard mm -hmm. there were many there was long stretches of my career that during the 80s that I was just really, it was very strident. It was much more strident, mm -hmm. and if it wasn't an audience that agreed with me, they probably wouldn't enjoy it. And there were a lot mm -hmm. of those nights, so I just tried to develop my own shows and do theaters, and I tried to work in venues that would, you know, kind of be on the same wavelength as I was, because the great thing about a theater audience is you can be serious for five seconds or mm -hmm. five minutes, and it doesn't come across as, oh my God, he's bombing. There's, mm -hmm. not, a, there's not a laugh in five mm -hmm. minutes, you know? And that's the difference between the, the club scene. But it's really trying to figure out what's going on, and mm -hmm. sometimes just connecting the dots with the humor. I mean, you know, you, you, the last eight months or whatever, six months in the country, look at all the things that have gone on. Okay, you've got Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan and unemployment and Wall Street and housing crisis and all these things are going mm -hmm. on. And f at some point I say, well, geez, what else could possibly happen? Mm -hmm. Pirates. <laughs> 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 Pirates. <laughs> What's next, the flu? I mean... Uh, <laughs> And so sometimes it's just a matter of trying to connect the dots and, and just hit people, you know, where they live. And in terms of everybody laughed, exactly. <laughs> pirates. Who would have thought we'd be talking about pirates? Well, it's great to see, you know, I'm so glad you were able to give a demonstration of this kind of live, you know, stand-up routine. And I was wondering, actually, because Penn focuses a lot, of course, on writers and the written page, and of course you write your own material, which is great to have you here, um, but a little quote that struck me recently is, in this guest-edited issue of Newsweek, <laughs> Stephen Colbert um, denounces, quote, the corrosive influence of the print media, end quote, adding, quote, I prefer to yell my opinions at you in person, quote. <laughs> um, do you feel these days, of course, with the uh, you know, impossible to overstate power of John Stewart, et cetera, um, that, you know, satire is kind of more effective on TV or on stage than on the page? And, you know, are there satirists who are writing specifically on the page who are, you know, having the same kind of impact? As anyone can just jump in on this. What do you think? Well, the thing about television, it comes across, obviously, right into your living room. And right. it's live, and there's an audience, and it's just an easier thing to absorb mm -hmm. than reading. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, we tried to get Maureen Dowd, folks, and got a very nice, um, you know, response, but she couldn't do it. But, you know, of course, I just was reading this, you know, angry. I mean, she certainly stirs up trouble in print, you know, without being um, live. But, yeah, who are, are there satirists who come to your mind who are specifically, you know, we have two fiction writers here and a poet um, in the world of fiction and poetry who have an impact, do you think? Well, well again, I, I, I don't view... Um, literary fiction generally as being satire per se, mm -hmm. it, it might well f comment on, on politics and, and, and things that are social, but, but attempting, a television, television attempts to address things um, that are immediate and mm -hmm. the effects are immediate and short lasting. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully with, with 
um, literature, the effects are, are, are a little more sustained. Um, I still read, my favorite um, um, satirist would be Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. um, does he speak to any particular, um, um, specifically to anything that's going on now? No, but generally about the human condition, right. he does. Um, the same of, of Swift, this, the same of, um, of, of even, um, who was the, the cowboy? Um, Will Rogers. Rogers. Will Rogers, yeah, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah who, in the poetry world, does anyone come to mind who's really? Well, you know, as, as we um, saw earlier and heard earlier when Richard um, gave the award, there are people all over the planet um, who are uh, struggling with horrendous uh, political situations. Certainly, for me, a crucial writer um, over the course of the second half of the 20th century is the Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert, mm -hmm. um, who, um, you know, in Poland is an enormous figure. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the difference for me uh, of a writer like Herbert or Twain or mm -hmm. Swift is that um, they're able to take satire past the sort of immediate response into the world of reflection. Mm -hmm. And so it, it goes to a deeper place. Television is fine, but it's response, basically. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow there's another response. Mm -hmm. Whereas people like Herbert or Twain are able to certainly be in touch with sati satire and humor, mm -hmm. but to go to a re reflective place about the human condition. Yeah, and that was, you know, one, another question that was thrown out is, you know, is satire intrinsically short term? And you were giving some good examples of where it can last, you know, how do satiric novels manage to stretch that out? And, you know, again, people were asking, is it more suited to the internet? You know, it's different kinds of things. There is the rapid response kind. But yeah, do you, in your readings down there, any one spring to mind fictionally or just purely on the page? Well, again, I'm going backwards. I'm looking at Vonnegut. I'm mm -hmm. looking at Catch-22. Right, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly who's doing the really modern right now. Yeah, who is the Vonnegut right now? I don't know. If you, Saunders, Saunders, George, yeah, George Saunders. Saunders. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's a great example, George Saunders. Tom Robbins, yeah. And Lisa, by the way, got a yeah. wonderful quote from Tom Robbins I for her novel. Thank you. Andy Borowitz uh -huh. uh, got a great The Borowitz Report. Uh, uh -huh. Really funny, very short, you know, a couple hundred words. Almost daily, really, mm -hmm. really funny stuff. Mm -hmm. Don DeLillo. Don DeLillo, right, mm -hmm. yeah. Danielle Steele. Danielle Steele. <laughs> <laughs> John Lennon, but we shot him. <laughs> right. And Teddy, who, we hate to make you represent youth again, but who's in, in terms of people in their 20s, are there, is there a Vonnegut out there? Do they read George Saunders? Do, do you feel like people in your well, generation? First of all, um, a lot of Lampoon grads, uh, I'd be remiss to uh, point out, including uh, Andy Borowitz, uh, oh. were just mentioned. Of the, um, I think The Onion is uh, basically the place where yeah. uh, young people get their satirical news. Yeah. Um, and The Onion is an incredible institution. I mean, it's just it's been going for so long and publishing for so long, mm -hmm. um, staying viable from a business perspective. It's, it's pretty impressive. I mean, I look at... Uh, Glenn, um, a lot of people have probably read uh, Paul Krugman's column that um, he just wrote about the sort of intensity of, of hate from uh, the right-wing right media. And yeah. Glenn Beck, uh, when he responded, started out with, um, oh, like the New York Times, that, that still exists. I'm, I'm surprised. Um, <laughs> and so I think there is this sort of almost occasional bullying between media of, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the, the printed word is sort of looked down upon uh, from other media. And so I think that... Um, that sort of comes out, you know, across all all sorts of forms of uh, of writing satire, definitely included. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just going to say that I think one of the turning points it can be satire can be really really effective and open the door for other people. It give, mm -hmm. can give permission to serious people to be more critical. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a turning point in the Bush administration and his popularity and also the off limits nature of his presidency after 9/11. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. One of the one of the turning points was Stephen Colbert at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe it was 05. It was mm -hmm. right after. The, yeah. And, you know, the, whoever put him up there thought he was the character that <laughs> he appears on television. <laughs> this, you know, 
gung-ho conservative, you know, right. whatever. <laughs> and he gets up there, and he was just incredibly funny and insightful. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, and I think in that forum, seeing all those other journalists in the room mm -hmm. who are, I, I think, a lot uh, more reserved in their criticism or their critique or just mm -hmm. their, the way they wrote about the administration, all of a sudden it gave them permission mm -hmm. to be more, uh, at least, uh, objective, shall we say. Right, and in the room it was said to bomb or whatever, but then it yeah. became this enormous hit on the internet. Right. Just unbelievable. Right. And, it, yeah. it, it was said to bomb because they were afraid to laugh. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. only were they afraid to write, they were afraid to laugh. <laughs> Sadly, I, I don't think there's been anything that's affected um, the culture that we live in the way, say, the painting Guernica affected the world. Mm -hmm. um, that says something about us. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the question that I, and I, that I remember on here as well that sort of reflects it was, it was whether our times are, are, are the worst, mm -hmm. uh, more or less. And it seems to me we're always proprietary about bad times. You know? <laughs> our time is the worst. And, and um, let's face it, you know, things have never been good as far as human beings have been concerned. Um, you know, I just think it's remarkable that we, we can aspire to be better given our, our, our history. I have a great quote from Elizabeth Benedict mm -hmm. uh, referring to George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld. She said <laughs> they can invade countries and force their subjects to maim and kill thousands of people. The power to make people laugh is what's left over for the rest of us who don't control armies and vast personal fortunes. Mm. Yeah, and I think there have definitely been points when, you know, people felt like that was the only outlet. I think that's part of Jon Stewart's power is when he rose up, the, he seemed to be, in a sense, to some people telling the truth, you know, and, you know, having a kind of truth that you can only have with that, you know, kind of humor, so. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of artistic freedom mm -hmm. and liberty in, in humor. You can mm -hmm. say whatever you want on, you know, and the targets are not, they don't have to be limited to one political mm -hmm. party or, or, or one individual or anything like that, mm -hmm. you know. That's one of the great things about it. And it, it, I think one of the struggles is, is to try to be, you know, to look at your own political values and mm -hmm. to criticize your own uh, opinions right. some, somewhat, or your own political feelings. Uh, that's always a challenge. Yeah. Stewart. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, one? yeah. Okay. Let's bring in John Stewart. John Stewart said um, about his show, it is a release valve in some respects. Mm -hmm. And if that's what we can be for people at times, I am very pleased to be that. You know, I think there is honor in being that little thing on the tire that you unscrew. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you for bringing him in. And you were going to say something too? Oh, I was just going to sort of agree with Jimmy's point about. Um, you know, taking John Stewart as an example, but especially you know, sort of the fake news or TV uh, mm -hmm. satire, giving people um, a really accessible voice to be cynical and critical about mm -hmm. the news. I mean, I read something, just sort of a, um, a, a post on an internet message board a few days ago where somebody uh, responded to the Iranian elections and they wrote, I could just imagine uh, what John Stewart would say about this. And uh, then they, they wrote, um, after uh, after angering the United States, Israel, Europe, etc., Iran has found another group of people to uh, to anger Iran, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and it was just interesting that to me that the way um, that it, that somebody that this poster on the internet thought um, the way that they came to the conclusion that they should be cynical about the news mm -hmm. was they imagined what John Stewart would right. say. Yeah. What right? would John Stewart say? Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and I think there's a sense in which uh, the more popular um, a certain form of expression becomes, the more people start to think in that voice, mm -hmm. and the more the implications of that voice um, sort of bake themselves into their consciousness. Right. Yeah, and in terms of changing things, I mean that you know that I think a whole generation has got that voice in their consciousness, not just him, but a, a yeah, whole exactly. series of you know comedians who kind of use that um, kind of ironic perspective. Now, what? A, yeah. I just wanted to add that you know one another thing is when the politicians themselves go on shows like mm -hmm. Saturday Night Live, right? Yeah. Or when they use humor yeah. themselves, it has yeah. a great humanizing effect. Oh yeah. With the audience, mm -hmm. um, when. Uh, McCain and Obama mm -hmm. did the 
what was it the uh, the dinner Al Al Smith dinner uh -huh, in New yeah. York right before the election? It was great to see them both in, being funny with their monologues. Right. And the same thing with uh, Sarah Palin when mm -hmm. she went on Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night mm -hmm. Live was doing some great stuff on mm -hmm. her for months leading up right. to the election. Yeah. And that was just great for them. It was mm -hmm. great for the country. And Sarah Palin went on, and I thought it was a huge, huge victory for her as well. She mm -hmm. came off very funny and confident. And when they mm -hmm. were doing the rap song about her, she's up there doing mm -hmm. the hands and stuff. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, speaking of turning points, I mean, Tina Fey, you know, how much did she have to do with, you know, the whole... Uh, because there was a time there where Sarah Palin was surging, yeah. and then I think that impersonation, so brilliant and so perfect, you know, had a certain impact. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Well, you have to remember that the, the best satirist for Sarah Palin was Sarah Palin. <laughs> I know when they had on the internet her actual words with Tina Fey, and that was very effective too. And now, of course, she's been in the news this past week. Very much so, you know, stirring up a lot of controversy about David Letterman's joke about one or another of her teenage daughters, and does it matter which one? And they really are, that's got people quite inflamed. And I wonder, that might be a sort of silly example of this, but are there um, areas where you feel like satirists should not go? I mean, you know, political families are trotted out very prominently on stage, and yet, are, is that, you know, during the Clinton administration, there would be criticism of Chelsea Clinton jokes and things like that. Are there places where you personally wouldn't go or where you feel satirists wouldn't go, or is that whole notion, you know, goes against the spirit of satire? I think it depends upon if the person has brought it on themselves. Uh -huh. You know, if somebody's out there campaigning for their father and they're a politician mm -hmm. and they're and they're of age, if they're over 21 and they're out mm -hmm. there campaigning, that's different. If somebody's 15 mm -hmm. and they might, you know, look a certain way or have some weird, you know, mannerisms and, and mm -hmm. people are going after them, mm -hmm. in my opinion, it's, it's kind of off base. It's mm -hmm. off limits for me personally, mm -hmm. but it's all it's all up to the person who, mm -hmm. with their own sense, that own inner, uh, you know, compass mm -hmm. that makes them what their level of comfortability is. Right. There is a, a line that, that, I don't know if it's a line that gets crossed, but there is a duplicity. Um, if anyone had made, and, I, and I, I can't stand Sarah Palin, but if anyone had, had made the comment that um, Hillary Clinton was wearing slutty stewardess clothing, I would have been offended. I would have thought it was sexist. Mm -hmm. So in that same way, I have to think that it's sexist when it's said about Sarah mm -hmm. Palin. So I, I don't think that that's acceptable, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure why it's not. Right, right. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I would definitely be on the side of, you know, being open to making fun of anything. And yet there were things that happened to Hillary Clinton during the you know, nutcrackers made of Hillary or what have you. And, you know, there, there were a lot of people quite upset about that. And it seemed somehow different than what was being directed at other people. So it's hard to... her own clothes anyway, right? <laughs> she doesn't own those clothes. Right, right. No, I think, I actually think Hillary owns her clothes. I think oh, Hillary, Sarah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I Sarah Palin, <laughs> different story. Question. Okay, feel free to line up at the microphone, and we've already got somebody there. So do you want to just address your question either to someone specific or to the whole panel, whichever you prefer? Well, I'd like to give a couple of examples on the matter of what goes too far, mm -hmm. tie a couple of ideas together. Um, Amy Goodman was one who got all upset when Newt Gingrich's mother said that he referred to Hillary as a bitch. Now, he didn't say it himself. She told Connie Chung that. Mm -hmm. And Amy Goodman devotes several pages to this, going on and on and on about how horrible it was. But uh, your boy Al Franken, in his book, which you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. several times refers to Ann Coulter as a bitch. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Do we have a double standard here? Okay, good question. Does the panel denounce this? Yeah. And finally, I want to drag in the example of the Sean Delonis cartoon in the New York Post, uh -huh. which portrayed um, the stimulus package as a chimpanzee mm -hmm. uh, being shot by uh, the cops in New York City. And some folks, the lefties, usually uh, mostly the lefties, uh -huh. uh, saw some connection between Obama and a chimpanzee, which is not intended. Mm -hmm. So uh, is that... Um, what, what is it with le liberals and leftists who see automatically, so quickly, connections between monkeys and black people? Okay, well, let's take that question. He's asking, you know, pretty clearly here. Someone want to jump in and address that? 
Do we think there's a double standard in terms of what people get outraged by? Well, I have to agree that I didn't think the cartoon, um, I didn't think of Obama when I saw um, the chimpanzee. Um, and I was amazed that anyone did. And, and um, I think that was more a, um, an indication of the, the deep-seated racism of all Americans, not just conservatives. I, I didn't think of a chimpanzee when I saw the, the, the chimpanzee. Um, but given that Ann Coulter is a bitch, um, <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, I don't find any duplicity there. Um. Well, it seems to me there's a difference between derision, mm -hmm. which is calling someone a bitch, mm -hmm. and satire. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I don't quite see, um, you know, um, see derision operating under the auspices of satire. I suppose if it's if it's just derision, then it's just derision. Name calling to me is derision. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the end of it for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Either of you want to jump in on that one? Or do I? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, specifically a, a gender-based uh, derision. I mean, the, the word "bitch." I think people get uh, derision. I mean, pe people can use it uh, as a code for all sorts of substantive issues, but by tangling it up uh, in a gender-specific term, I think you sacrifice a lot of credibility. Mm -hmm. Except yeah. for all those guys that are bitches, right? <laughs> <laughs> And I, yeah, I think when that word comes in, whether it was directed at Hillary Clinton or, you know, Ann Coulter, people do get riled by it. I mean, that right. that does tend to happen on both ends. I think. Yeah. Now, you want to ask a question here? Uh, uh, you can probably adjust that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first, just a point of information. Mm -hmm. I think there are tons of histories of black people written from the perspective of Strom Thurmond. Yeah, that's true. We generally call them history <laughs> textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> but the question is, have, can any of you talk about some direct experiences where your satirical work and, say, and the work of a particular social um, change group connect, you know, where you're working together and you see some changes happening because of reaching people through the satire? Hmm. Um, I have a novel called Erasure, in which um, the main character um, takes on, the, the, the novel takes on the publishing industry and its um, um, insistence on creating the, uh, the, the, the category black fiction. Um, and since, and when the novel came out, um, I actually mentioned Borders books in the, in the, in the novel as a villain. Um, um, and, and when the novel came out, I was called by Barnes and Noble. Um, uh, someone from their corporate office called me and, and assured me, as if I have any power, that they would not have a black fiction section. They would, however, continue to put independent bookstores out of business, but they would not have a black fiction. Can we get rid of the women's section, too? Yes, really. <laughs> women's section. Thank you. Yeah. Women's fiction. Yeah. yeah, it looked like there were, are there any groups connecting up with what you're doing with, you know, violence against? I don't know. It's too early. Yeah. Because it doesn't yeah. come out until October, right. so yeah. I, I really have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if Harvard Lampoon ever had that kind of experience with a group, you know, seizing something they did and using it in their own cause. I mean, there's a, a chance that back when, when anyone read The Lampoon that happened, I, I can't comment about it. <laughs> Okay, next question. Yeah, well, uh, some people have talked about the you know, question of is there a double standard and um, this issue of derision versus satire. And I, I wonder if we can get some comments about just the question of um, uh, power versus powerlessness. And um, I mean, it seems to me that, if, that a group or a person out of power making fun of people in power is satire. People in power or privileged people making fun of the powerless or the mm -hmm less privileged is ridicule or derision. Mm -hmm. So that's why sometimes something that might seem like a double standard may not be. But given all that, I guess my question is, I'm, I know I'm supposed to only have one, but it's sort of a two part. <laughs> one is now that a lot of the people who we in this room or on this panel probably agree more with are actually in literal power, um, how does that shift the game? And are there people on, um, 
the conservative end of the spectrum, the right wing, who are making and writing satire. Do any of you follow it? Do any of you think it's any good? Mm -hmm. um, Teddy mentioned Glenn Beck previously. He's sort of the only person who came to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, if you do follow it and they're good, why do you think they are? If you think they're not, why do you think they're not? Mm -hmm. Michael's so good. We have a seat up here, Michael, if you want. <laughs> nah, I don't bother to. Do you watch Fox News? I, I'm not well, I, I would jump in to say that on the panel, we reached out and tried to get um, someone clearly from the right wing, and I don't actually know how any of you guys vote exactly, but, um, you know, yeah, but I think that's a great question, and, um, you know, is, are there people from the opposite end of the spectrum where you are, whatever that is, um, who you read and are interested in or who sometimes make an impact on how you think? They're just so not funny. <laughs> it's really the problem. Also, uh, the, the satire and, and parody that, that, that moves me or, or I find interesting uh, doesn't really have in it an agenda. Mm. It takes what, what is happening and, and exposes the absurdity of it, and that's the end um, of, of the mission of... of, of, of of the writer, um, but it seems to me that for the most part, from what I've seen, and I watch Fox News because I find them hilarious, um, probably for all the reasons they don't want me to find them hilarious, <laughs> but when I, when, I, when I listen to them, they're so not funny that it is hilarious. Um, and, and, I only, and it's not because I don't agree with them, I think this, I think this because I listen to their arguments, they're so dumb. And, and again, I'm not saying this in, to be derisive in, in, in any way. It's just, um, <laughs> this is just an observation in the way that the squirrels are gray. And, and yeah, and you, were Darren, that, and you were Teddy. Yeah, I mean, I think Michael makes an interesting point about the position of power dictating how something comes off as right. satire. I mean, you look at Stephen Colbert uh, doing a USO show, um, mm -hmm. having... Obama call in, you know, having mm -hmm. Clinton and two Bushes appear, uh, mm -hmm. and it's hard uh, to think of him as this sort of defiant, uh, you know, speak truth to power type right. figure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, it, you know, in, in some senses, um, the the American tendency to, uh, for the government to to shift in a relatively short amount of time makes it hard for anyone to be a, a sort of defiant figure for too mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Baron. I, I think the uh, the point you know that you raise, or Michael, um, the the satire that interests me, and I, I think we've talked about this in various ways, is is satire of human nature. So to me, the political part is really comes after the human mm -hmm. nature part. Mm -hmm. So that's always there. And thinking of Twain, I mean, I think Obama is an enormous figure for satire. Um, because what's more to satirize than virtue, right? <laughs> I, I mean, it's just, you know, there it is. So, but it comes to human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you both, uh, Mr. Everett and Mr. Wormser, have started to answer my question, which is how exactly satire works and is it, how, how, does it, how can it rise above just preaching to the choir? Because if you look at, um, the quote someone had from about Rush Limbaugh or something earlier, you know, or Karl Rove, that the right's just going to agree with that and the left's just not. And so how can satire, and, and Mr. Wormser earlier talking about getting to a level of reflection, but I'm, and, and Mr. Everett just now about um, not having an agenda and just satirizing the, the absurd. So how can sat, uh, how, in, especially in this day and age, how can satire uh, rise above just, you know, easy uh, categories and actually uh, get people thinking or seeing in a different way um, than their usual political or, or other um, leanings? Mm -hmm. I'll take my answer off the air. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Lisa actually um, answered that for me and when she said that um, if you decide what you're writing, if, that you have, if you have a message in something, it will, it will ring hollow. Um, we're writers and really nobody gives a damn what we think. Um, it's, and again, we're, we're not pundits, we, we, we make literary art uh, so that uh, 
the there is no agenda, there is no message. Whatever you get out of it is, is whatever you make is fine with, with I think, fine with us. Um, mm -hmm. and, and have you uh, stepped inside your character or are you simply going for the joke? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, I think always as a writer, um, you have to, uh, including satire, you have to admit contradiction. If you can't admit contradiction, then you're really not, you know, a serious writer. Certainly for me, I'm best known as a poet, and one of my favorite definitions of the art I've practiced for decades is by the poet William Matthews, which is that poetry is stand-up tragedy. <laughs> great, great quotes, yes. Hi. Um, I guess my, my thunder was already stolen, so I don't really have a question, but I'll just make a brief comment. Um, relating the, uh, the power of humor, mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking in terms specifically of the minstrel tradition in this country, mm -hmm. and how it was, uh, you know, for decades, if not maybe a century, the most popular form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And it really arose out of a uh, political and I guess social need to ridicule the the uh, freed black community in the North uh, before the war, before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just had, had, a, had a, a very potent, um, affected the culture deeply. And I think if you see any movies today uh, with black comedians or black humor in general, you still see the, the lingering effects of the minstrel mm -hmm. tradition. It's still alive in many ways. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I don't, I don't think that there's been a, you know, sort of a, uh, an analog to that in terms of humor attacking the powerful, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I don't think, well, maybe Twain a little mm -hmm. bit, but. Do you think that um, rap is, is close to the minstrel t tradition in certain ways? Uh, some of it, yeah, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. And it's interesting that it, it kind of got co-opted by Vachel Lindsay, by, by a white man, right? And then he became pretty big in the minstrel tradition. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly in folk music as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the yeah, American way. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, it is. Uh, uh, it's uh, to co-opt and take the power out of a thing. Um, when you hear a car salesman using rap to sell Buicks, um, some power has been removed from, from the form. And, and right. that, mm -hmm. uh, at least from the Buick. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my question is in two parts. First, I'd like to ask you if you have personally ever experienced one of the pit, one of the possible pitfalls of writing satire, and that is being completely misunderstood, and how did that feel? Mm -hmm. um, then secondly, I'd like to ask if you think it's harder to be an effective satirist today when there is a John Stewart and a Stephen Colbert and a Keith Oberholzer out there in everybody's face all the time. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, you know, Teddy had mentioned earlier the lampoon being misunderstood, they felt, on the National Geographic, you know, question, you know, satire. Yeah, I think that's... Yeah, I think, I think that's definitely true, although it's always very easy when somebody uh, refers to anything as offensive to claim that they misunderstood it, so, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think, um, the lampoon has certainly be, been misunderstood um, in some cases, but a lot of times we try and offend people, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have any of you, uh, first of all, anything you've written that's been wildly misunderstood? You were saying before the panel, almost being called a satire was a misunderstanding of some of the things that you it is were writing. Well, well, offending somebody isn't necessarily the same as being misunderstood. I mean, what if somebody took you seriously? like a modest proposal mm -hmm. was taken seriously by mm -hmm. some. Well, mm -hmm. When people feel offended by my work, I feel fairly successful. Um, <laughs> I, first, I don't, I'm not, I don't feel in any competition at all with, with, um, with, with John Stewart or, or I mean, they're doing different things. Uh, um, but to that end, anything that makes people in this culture think more, I think can only benefit me as I write serious literature. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, it's a great thing, and, but it's in no way um, uh, a source of competition. Um, 
but what is Whitman? I, I don't. I will not get the line right. I have a poet beside me, and, and Whitman's um, by on blue by on blue Ontario shore or by blue Ontario shore. There's a, a couple of lines uh, that say essentially, if you want a better society, produce better people. And I think that's why we all do what we do, whatever form that is. And there's a quote I just saw recently uh, by Martin Luther King about people not wanting to really think or think deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I think just life is offensive. Life is really difficult. Yeah. And uh, if we can find some sense of humor, some way to get mm -hmm. through, I think that's, that's fantastic. Yes, another question. Hi, could we look at the other side of the same question? Mm -hmm. I'm just hoping that some of you have a story of someone who came to you having responded to something that you wrote and said, I'm different now, or, mm -hmm. or you touched me, or mm -hmm. you got this email that you've got on your refrigerator or something. That's a great question, yeah. Any, anyone getting response like that? I, I know I have said that to Barron about his poems. You know, George Bush, those poems did change me. And I'm sure you've gotten other responses like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I have a really creepy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have a creepy. I have a really creepy story about it. I had a former student show up at, at on my ranch, um, um, and um, I said, "Well, it's good to see you." And he said, "Yeah." He said, "I have something to show you." I said, "Okay." At which point, he took off his shirt and he turned around, and on his back were several tattooed on his back were. The, bind, the bindings of several books. Among them was a, was a novel of mine um, with my name on his back. Um, and I said, my name is on your back. <laughs> <laughs> he said, yes, well, uh, these, books, these are the books that have influenced me. And, um, and I said, well, why don't you put your shirt back on? <laughs> so, so, it did influence someone. <laughs> Yes. I had a question for you, Elizabeth. Um, hypocrisy and hubris seems to make satirists lick their chops um, a lot. What do you look for um, in Bristol Palin, for, um, for example? Um, is there something about Tanya Harding or Nancy Kerrigan or Bristol that has aroused those sensibilities in you? Well, thank you for asking. And those are people I've written about. And actually, yes, um, well, for me, and I'm a fiction writer, and I really relate to what Percival and Barron said earlier, that I wouldn't be able to write about them if I didn't feel a connection, a kind of point of connection with them. And like with Bristol Palin, um, I'm just fascinated by what she's going through, and frankly, very sympathetic to her. Um, and I wound up writing a short story just trying to imagine her on the campaign bus N taking care of her mother's baby while pregnant with her own baby and thrust into the spotlight and all of that. And I found myself very fascinated. And so with her, I was more inspired not so much by satire as by a novel, um, American Wife, um, in which a novelist pretty seriously, I think, tries to imagine what it's like to be Laura Bush. And she's obviously sympathetic to her and, um, you know, as I said, it's pretty serious. With Tanya Harding, um, just briefly, you know, the combination that appeals to me as a writer is the the absurdity of her situation and the poignancy of it. Like, I always found that a very poignant story. And, you know, we try to do both elements. We wrote a rock opera about Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan and try to get both sides of it, the, the dark, absurd humor as well as the, just the sadness of it. There was something very sad about that story to me. And I don't know if, you know, I love what Barron said about when he realized he wanted to write about a hapless individual and then realized he was writing about a certain president that, you were connecting, you know, and that's what's amazing about those poems is I read them and most, many people did, you know, at the height of all sorts of things happening in the Bush administration and um, there was this humanity to it. There's, there's a picture of, it's either Bristol or her sister, the next one down, mm -hmm. and holding um, the, Sarah Palin's baby mm -hmm. and she has um, a pacifier and, and no hands left to hold mm -hmm. the pacifier, so she has it in her own mouth. Mm -hmm. And mm. I thought that says everything. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Hello, um, I'm an international student uh, studying film in Chicago, filmmaking in Chicago. And one of the things that jumped at my eye first time when I came to America was that there were so many black uh, homeless people in this magnificent mile. 
So one day I was wanted, I wanted to write a script about this story of this black homeless pe person. Mm -hmm. And my teacher in my screenwriting class, she thought that this is not a good idea because this has this stereotype fixating effect. So mm -hmm. she was saying like, why don't you why don't you have a white person as your main character or why don't you have other person mm -hmm. or you can add a little bit of this fantasy effect or dream quality effect making more of comedy or mm -hmm. satire so i was like okay then is kind of comedy kind of method of escapism escapism cuz mm -hmm. you don't want to deal with the reality of the life so you mm -hmm. choose the other way to speak about it so i was mm -hmm. a little bit perplexed about this political like, correctness in america mm -hmm. so what you guys think about the satire as this kind of first way? of all i think we all want to say bad teacher <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's so much in that question yeah what you know we see comedy as necessarily an escape, and you're, yeah, you say bad teacher. Why do you say bad? Well, teacher? there is a kind of comedy that is that is an escape, but that that's usually not satiric. Um, um, comedy always creates some distance, but the distance one wants to create with satire is a distance that's required to think that you need to think about um, something. Um, you know, the I, I'm alarmed by by what you were told um, because. You can certainly use, use satire and comedy to make the, the, the reality of a situation clear, but I think in America we often um, will attempt to, this, pardon the expression, whitewash a problem by, by whitewashing the problem. <laughs> yeah, anyone else want to comment on that interesting question? <laughs> not, not, to, not down there. Yeah. It's a tough one. The, yeah, whole, the whole thing about how politically correct to be and not to mm -hmm. be and, and who you have a right to write about. Right, yeah, that's a whole issue in itself and it's, it's a great one to consider with this is, yeah, that, yeah. and I, I would <laughs> chime in, I don't think that a writing teacher's role is to say, no, don't try it. Hardly, I mean, because then you just start proposing endless divisions, basically. Mm -hmm. Men can't write about women, et cetera, mm -hmm. and you just wind up nowhere, really. Mm -hmm. Well, this, and this, the whole notion of political correctness is, is this um, monster created by the right to try to take language away from the rest of us. Um, and, and like idiots, the rest of us adopted the language of political correctness, and now we worry about it. Um, so it, it, there is no such thing. as It's still a lie. If you speak truthfully and you speak um, and you try to speak fairly, it's not a problem. The problem is when, is when you get seduced by that bad language that was introduced by the right. And I like the word that you use, bewildering, finding it bewildering, the politically correct. And here's another questioner. Um, so I wrote mine down so that I wouldn't forget it. Um, I found that many people in my generation feel that the issue of equality has effectively been solved. Um, although I myself feel that inequality has just become more hidden and faceless. Um, has this um, more obscure enemy made satire a more difficult subject for American writers to face? Mm. Yeah, feel, feeling the issue of equality has been somehow solved. Does that mentality make things more difficult to write satire right now? Or Teddy, again, drawing on you as the representative of youth, do you agree with that? Do you think that a lot of people are feeling that right now? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think, um, I mean, you could just look uh, at, you know, at, at data average, average salary across races, genders. I mean, it, it, it's hard to argue that equality's been solved. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is a sense in which people, um, people think that equality in the U.S. is good enough that it's time to focus on something else, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't think is accurate. Mm -hmm. so, why, so why is everybody so angry? <laughs> why is so, everyone so angry? There's a great article by Frank Rich in the New York Times online right now about the Obama haters. Mm -hmm. There's so much venom. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I think... Um, 
I don't know that Ob Obama hatred and, and um, equality being solved are, are necessary. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there are a lot of things driving Obama hatred, uh, his celebrity, I mean, his, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the sense of the inevitability of his reelection. Um, mm -hmm. But even with Obama having been elected president, uh, I mean, the reality is of, of the, the gaps uh, in, in quality of life for different groups in America is just so huge that it's, I mean, it, it's really, I think, quite evident that, um, that in reality it hasn't been solved, even if in, mm -hmm. maybe, perhaps in the public's uh, perception, in some senses it has. Mm -hmm. And your question makes me wonder, is there going to be some satirist who will somehow take on that? You know, that's, it seems like it's... One of the questions I didn't get to ask was, was there something ripe for satire that you feel is not getting its due? And I think her question is interesting. Is, is, is there a false sense of, oh, everything's fine now, and is someone going to get that? So surely they will. 